This system will notify you once you begin your broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, let's do a sound check, get that out the way. Loud well, and clear. Thank you, James. Good to see you. All right, let me just get into character. Hello everyone, today is Thursday, May 23rd, 2019, and this is a week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and I think that's the elephant in the room. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides. And that's just for your benefit, so my ADD doesn't kick in. And then towards the end, we open up for individual stock picks. You can ask uh, questions and general anything requiring a lot of thought. I will put together a presentation, and we'll do it in the members area, and I'll give you – maybe I'll give you access. I'll give you access to the Q&A for that particular week. Hold off on your stock picks until we get to the individual charts. Think about them, though, now, so uh, we'll be ready. We won't wait around for those. Also, just ask about one stock at a time, and that's for your benefit to make sure it gets covered. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I think I'm going to continue on with what we talked about over the last few weeks and definitely want to focus mostly on the market itself, but I still want to continue to talk about a simple little system for timing the market. Now, as you know, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Stole that from Greg Morris. And the disclaimer screen also flew by a minute ago. You can get that off my website if you're really bored. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things in there, though, like, you know, in case of rash, just continue use. If you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast, and things like that. All right, I want to do an update on a TFM 10% system. I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining the system because we've done that over the past several weeks and I kind of beat it to death. But basically, we're just looking to get out of a market when we're 10% away from the 50-week closing high and we close below the 50-week moving average and we buy the market or get back in, whatever the case may be, when we're less than 10% away from that closing high and we are above the 50-week moving average, or two lows, I should say, or above the 50-week moving average. In other words, there's two weeks of lander light. And I'll walk you through quite a few on this. And we want to exit again when the market's 10% or more away from its 50-week closing high. So the theory is as long as the market is doing okay, meaning okay in this particular instance that we're within 10% of the closing high, 50-week closing high, and – we are, let's say, two weeks or two weeks exactly above the 50-week moving average, then we want to get long and we want to stay long until and unless we're more than 10% away from that 50-week closing high and we close below the 50-week moving average. And that's the whole system right there. Really, really simple, but it's easy to get a little tripped up on it here and there. So again, we stay long as long as there's Landry light and we're within 10% of the 50-week closing high. And the ribbon on the bottom, you can see, stays bullish. And then when we're 10% or more away from that 50-week closing high and we close below the 50-week moving average, then we look to get out, or we do get out. The theory here is if the markets are going down 
it's going to go down 10% first. And conversely, if the market's going to go up another 100%, it's going to have to get within 10% of that closing high. And that's pretty much it. I noodled with this quite a bit, and I was very reluctant to put any whipsaw filters in at all. And the only whipsaw filters we have, as you know, is just two weeks of the Landry light, which introduces a little lag to the system. But in some cases, it will take out a little bit of the whipsaw. So the last sell signal we had, and I'm going to talk a lot about what's happened since, but we did have the sell signal on November 23rd, 2018. And you can see the little ribbon in the bottom went bearish on that. And again, I'm going to just kind of whiz through all these so we can get to a couple of thoughts I want to talk about this week. So we did have a buy signal fairly recently, and we're still under that buy for now, by the way. And notice that we were within 10% of the 50-week closing high, and there was Landry light, in other words, two weeks where the market was above its 50-week moving average. Now, again, I'm not trying to sell you a system. The point I'm trying to make is that a system, a simple system can work. And one thing that we talked a little bit about last week, at the last minute I programmed, I'm always doing like, last minute research or something. I'm thinking about moving the weekly charts up an hour just so I'll have more time to get, get done. But what is it called? The Parkinson effect. Work will expand to fit the amount of time available. So I'd probably just end up doing more research. But I'm noodling with that. But let's take a look at what I developed last week right before we went live and flesh that out a little bit more. So basically I'm saying I want to plot an indicator that is 10% away from the 50 week closing high. And that kind of gives you a visual representation of when you are within that 50 week high, okay? So as long as you're above this line, in other words, the visual representation is, as long as you're above this line, you're doing pretty good. When you're below this line, things begin to get a little questionable. And if you have the moving average in here, the system will actually exit when you get further than 10% away. In other words, when you cross this line here. So I think this makes a really cool way to show you what's happening. Now, as you'll see in one second, when you have a V-shaped recovery, this line does not catch up. But when the market drops for a long, long, long time, in 2002, 2003, was a great example of that because it took so long for this market to bottom, your 50 week look back period just kept dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And that was able to catch up to the market fairly quickly. And you could see it would have got you in pretty soon or early, I should say, in the developing bull market after that bear market. Now, on the flip side, if you do have like a V shaped recovery, it's going to get you out of the market. The only problem is. It's not going to get you in at lower levels. And that's just a nuance of the system. And that's not always a bad thing. For instance, the last time we had this little drop when the system sold out, notice that the line stayed flat. It did not follow the market lower. Now, if we would have gone into a longer term bear slide, then it would have, been, would have begun to follow the market lower. Now, like I said last week, and again, I'm not going to beat the dead horse too much on this, but the main thing to glean from this or any other simple system, such as Landry Light, for instance, notice the Landry Light below the 50-week moving average for a long, long time. Look at 50-week bow ties if you want. I, I kind of beat the dead horse on that so much. People ask me to stop showing them. But these little simple systems can work quite well. And here you have Landry Light almost this entire, in fact, maybe this entire bear market of 2007. 2007 caught everybody off guard, but we had so many signals that triggered. And then, and again, I know I've said this over and over, but even in October of 2007, right as the market was making new highs, I couldn't find a long to save my life. And finally, I was like, well, guys, I've got to show you something here. I'm just seeing these charts. Let's start shorting this market. And internally, it just was a database talking. But in addition to that, we ended up with like a bow tie, weekly bow tie in 2007, believe it or not, early 2008. 
I didn't, there was a plethora of, of other signals back then. But the point I'm trying to make here is the magnitude of the sell-off. Notice that when you get further than 10% away from that 50-week closing high, it's usually a good time to get out of the way. And this last little sell-off here, it didn't look like much, but it's quite a bit. And we'll pick that apart in just one second. So one thing I was looking at this morning, or woke up thinking about, I should say, is we had this huge run from lows and peaked the trough. It was like 25% market move. And, and I'm going to talk about that in quite a bit of detail in just a minute or two. And then this particular system only made 2% because it got you in quite late. And that's another one of those V-shaped recoveries. But getting back to the, the run from the lows, you can see the market ran 25% higher but the one thing i thought about this morning is comparing that two percent run to the 25 percent run in the overall market for buy and hold is not necessarily an apples to apples comparison because the market dropped in between so for instance here's your sell signal here and then here's your buy signal here so you can see it was sort of late getting in from this v-shaped recovery and that's not what it's intended to do anyway now if you look at the run as of yesterday's close from the lows that's an 18 percent run so you're thinking wow buy and hold you'd have made 18 percent in that run but the thing to realize is that you would have still been long from the prior peak and in that particular run you would have only made two percent with this system and maybe less than that today but you also, by trading the system, would have avoided this big slide in here. And that's an 11% slide, and that's significant. When my phone starts ringing from friends and relatives, and they start panicking, in one particular case, they were, they were down quite a bit in the 401k, twice as much as they put in, plus, plus more. And they were like, geez, I don't make that in, in one, one quarter. And so... It was really beginning to weigh on them, and a lot of people began to panic at that particular time. But again, you have to realize that, and this is what I was thinking about this morning, is you can't look at buy and hold making 18% because you would have avoided that particular slide, and that's measuring peak to trough again. And you only need to look at the run from where you got back in. Also, the system kept you out of the market for 98 days. And again, I'm not trying to sell you on the system. The point I'm trying to make is something simple can really help you to stay on the right side of the market and certainly keep you out of a lot of trouble. And before I digress too far, I do want to say that keep in mind that market timing is hard, especially when you have a market like we've had over the past 10 years or so that pretty much just goes up, not in a linear fashion. That's the other part too. The market has gone up, but it's had some pretty big swings in between. Now, if you go back to the peak and you look at buy and hold, it's not up 18%. It's actually in a drawdown or still in a drawdown since it peaked back in September. Okay, so if you look at where we were then and where we are as of yesterday, it's actually down 2%. Now, keep in mind that this particular system will lose 10% of its value, okay? You will have a 10% drawdown before the system kicks in. But in this particular case, you avoided another 11%. And that's pretty substantial. And I call it diaper change moments, stealing from Ian McActivy. I can never say his name right. Rest in peace, Ian. Uh, anyway, so you would avoid this big slide, but of course you will have to give up something in the end. So you stayed long for a long, long time if you look back at that spreadsheet before this slide. And then now you're making up some of that drawdown. So you made back about 2%. Now, once you get past 10%, the numbers get a lot bigger. But at 10%, you only have to make back 11.1%. .1, so it's pretty close to 10% as far as recovery. So if we come back 10%, we're almost to break even on this thing, and we've already recouped 2% of that run. So 
I know there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, but I did think it's kind of interesting because I remember it's like, wow, that's a big run to miss, 18%, and it was 25%. But you really haven't missed all of that run because you avoided, again, a big chunk of that on the downside, and you only took a 10% hit, and now you're beginning to make some of that back. So just kind of picking it apart here. I don't know if, again, is this becoming lies, damn lies, and statistics? I don't know. But I think it does show one thing. One, it is important to miss these big slides in the market. Number two, staying out of the market for 98 days, especially when it gets really questionable like it did for quite a few weeks, that is very important. And again, your sell signal would have been here and you, you would have lost on a closing basis, you would have lost 10% and that would be a 10% drawdown because the system only kicks in after 10%. So again, only up 2%, but you avoided that 11% drop. And then like we talked about last week and week before and week before, these big drops in here, 44%, 50-something percent, if you were trading in a NASDAQ, maybe 67% or 70% drops would have been avoided. But of course, you will start off with a bit of a slide this number would be 10 percent bigger and i don't know how the math works on that so it'd be 585 10 percent 58 points you know so this number would have been a little bit bigger without the drawdown in it okay but you drew down open profits until you stopped out so hopefully that makes sense and again some whipsaws cannot be avoided like that death and taxes it's only 10 trades in 30 years the point I'm trying to make, again, is simple systems can work. And buy and hold is really, really hard to beat. But I think whenever you look at buy and hold, you have to look at the magnitude. Like, for instance, a golden cross, I wouldn't rush out and trade those. And I wouldn't, especially like the death cross, I wouldn't rush out and trade those things either. But what you need to look at is the magnitude of the drop after something like a death cross going back in history. Because if you... When I say don't trade the golden cross, be like, okay, well, I'm going to sell when it goes below the golden, when the golden cross, I'm sorry, I'm going to sell the death cross happens and I'm going to buy back when the golden cross happens. Well, in between, you could have a huge 50% decline or more. And it, it looks like, well, you would have broke even on a trade. Well, the reality is the magnitude of the loss would have been really big. And like I said over prior weeks, there's no guarantees, but every big drop has started with a little drop first. And that's sort of the basis of technical analysis is you have to cut your losses short. And you can't, obviously, you, don't, you, you, you will have some losses in this particular system. You will have to give up at least 10% of those open profits before getting knocked out. But the bottom line is at some point, you have to get out of the way. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. All right, I've been beating the dead horse on this. I promise to back off on it a little bit. Uh, who am I kidding? I'm probably going to keep beating the dead horse. But if you have any questions, let me know right now, and then we'll move on to the markets. Okay, the question is, is winter still coming? Everybody knows that bastard John Snow has been saying winter is coming. I guess winter has come now. Winter has came. Let me get my tense right on that. Everybody watch the finale of Game of Thrones. My big concern has been, as I've been saying, a nausea is this V-shaped recovery at a high level. Now, if the market's down 50% or 60% as a V-shaped recovery, that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, what's amazing is some of the best rallies actually come in bear markets, believe it or not. Certainly the, the ones that are fastest and the biggest magnitude. So that's kind of an interesting observation. The problem is when you're at a high level, the market is very, very overbought by the time it gets all the way back to its old highs. And it's very hard for it to sustain that rally. And again, that's a 25% run. So that's very substantial. Now, if we look to the S&P 500, the moving averages of 20 to 30 were right about the same level this morning before I check. Now with today's open, if we close anywhere below where we are now, it should have an official bow tie down. With a bow tie, 
you want a one bar pullback. In some cases, you only get a higher low. And those, especially after like a wide range bar down, can be significant. So let me, it'd be easier to just draw it in. I'm sitting here trying to tell you. So here you had a bow tie. Notice here you have a higher low and you have a lower high. So it's not technically a one bar pullback. However, because this was a wide range bar down, I see this as a official setup. But then you still made the higher high and the higher low, obviously here, because it continued to pull back. So you trigger on the pullback after the bow tie would have been somewhere in here. Obviously the market didn't go straight down, but the signal stayed valid and the market did drop significantly from that signal. So with any type of this simplified trend following that I'm trying to tweak and observe and however you want to look at it, the bottom line is that it will help to keep you on the right side of the market as long as you don't try to complicate things too much. So let's take a look at the, well, let's back the S&P out one second. Now, again, this was a slide from the last bow tie. My big concern, in addition to the V-shaped recovery, is the fact that we do have a potential double top in the works. Now, as I often say, keep in mind that a double top rarely unfolds like it does in these classical technical analysis textbooks, or even in more recent times, people show you, oh, it's a double top, and I'm like, well, a lot of times, as I often say, they undershoot or overshoot that double top, and that tricks even more people into the market. For instance, if we would have overshot this double top by a little bit more, in fact, we did make new closing highs, and that's probably enough to suck some people in, but if we'd have shot up here somewhere, it would have sucked even more people in before it turned around and spit them out. Some people call it a bear trap, so that's probably a good way of putting it. Now, NASDAQ has officially crossed over as of yesterday. So with today's data, it, it will certainly probably, or almost guaranteed, unless we have the mobile rallies, still be an official crossover. And again, last time that happened in NASDAQ, you can see pretty textbook in nature, pretty much textbook in nature. We had a pretty serious slide. Now, keep in mind, bow ties off of all-time highs or let's say all-time lows in the case of an index, hopefully we never see all-time lows again, but maybe like a decade plus low, those are the ones that you want to pay most attention to. So NASDAQ, same sort of action going on, bow tie off to all-time highs, could get pretty ugly pretty quick. And again, like the P's, there is a potential double top in the works. Now, the Russell did bow tie down. I'm not as concerned about a bow tie that's coming off of multi-month highs. I am concerned, again, when it's coming off of all-time highs like we did back here. And then, as you know, we had a pretty serious slide from here all the way down to here. That was fairly ugly. What concerns me is the fact that we had this big picture retrace in the Russell 2000 and we didn't make it back to old highs, we stalled well short. And we had just enough fake out in here to possibly suck some people in. Now, remember earlier I said double top never shakes out or usually doesn't shake out in a textbook fashion. What happens is right around this level here, people are thinking, well, it's gonna go back to the old highs, I better just jump in. And then the market turns around and spits them out. So this is fairly ugly. This actually had, was captured like right after the open. So on a weekly basis, you can see so far, it looks like it's trying to make a new leg lower. You know the routine one day at a time. If this thing gets back above 160, then we might be okay. Okay, any questions on the market itself? We'll take a look at some sector action, a few other things in just one second. I want to talk a little bit about discretion versus throwing caution to the wind. So we entered this pins trade about a week ago, and then unfortunately it began to implode on the next day, and we're going to pick that apart in just one second. So we had a stop at 24. Now technically and mechanically, that stop got hit, okay? So if you're following everything on a mechanical basis, if you were new to trading or new to the methodology, there's nothing wrong with getting out on a mechanical basis, meaning that if it stops at 24, you get out at 24. 
However, as I preach and as I talked about a lot in yesterday's Q&A, it's been harder in more recent years to make things work mechanically. In other words, if I say, hey, get in at 30, put a stop at 24, let's have an initial profit target at 36, it's like, well, it might get to 35 and three quarters and just not quite get to that initial profit target. Or it might have like a gap open on the trigger and then come right back in. So if you're using a little discretion, it would not have been a technical entry. And as I think I said yesterday, we had either three out of four or four out of four trades. And at least three of those worked late last year. And these are the ones that really stick out in my mind. But every one of them, or at least three out of four of those, required a tremendous amount of discretion to make them work. Now, that's this doesn't mean you're throwing caution to win and not honoring stops. But if something gets nicked, if you have an opening gap reversal or something like that, then you go ahead and just give it a little bit of discretion. So in this particular case, officially, yes, it got stopped out. So it, it scores a loser in the portfolio. But it did find its low this morning. This morning. So if you have an uncle point, let it open. Now, again, throwing caution in the wind means if it keeps dropping, then you just don't pay attention or whatever. You close your eyes, I should say, stick your head in the sand, whatever you want to say, and you let it just keep dropping. Then you, you can get in a lot of trouble fast. But if we take a look at what happened this morning, you can see that it did dip well below that stop, but it was only like 20 cents. When you look at a five minute chart, it's a little bit scarier. And then it found its low. So if you have your stop, your new stop below this uncle point, so to speak, or right around this uncle point, about 2360 or something, you're risking a little bit more in a trade, but the idea is that maybe you survived that shakeout. Now, one more thing I want to show you with this Pinterest trade, and I'm rereading Linda's book, Linda Rasky's book, and it's really good. And I'm nearly done with my reread. And I thought it was kind of cool that she she did she brings up a lot of really good points when it comes to the markets. And one thing she said, she lost a lot of money. I guess it was hogs or something. But one thing she pointed out is if you do lose a lot of money in one particular market, you don't have to make it back in that market. You can make it back somewhere else. So you do have to be careful of revenge trading. But in the case of the pens, which imploded overnight, I figured it was worth going in for an opening gap reversal trade. And then I picked apart this trade yesterday, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but if you go into Q&A, I talked a lot about my thinking in this. And it really didn't work out that great, made a little bit on the first loaf and then scratched out on the remainder. But I was able to make back a little bit of those losses overnight. Now, again, you gotta be careful not to revenge trade. But in this particular case, I figured, okay, it's a deep retracement or an IPO, it's oversold. It does have the potential to turn back up. And I actually thought, and maybe I was just hoping, but I actually thought it would go positive on a day. If that would have happened, I would have done really, really well. But I made back a little bit on the trade. Okay, any questions about anything so far? If you are a member, a gold member, of my members area, make sure you do join the Facebook group. If I haven't approved you yet, please let me know. There's some really good commentary that gets posted there. And I've found quite a few trades from the group and I've actually thrown out a few trades too that have worked out, knock on wood. So check that out. And again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details in this because I talk about it every week, but if you truly do wanna be successful, I believe the members area, of course, I'm biased, but with the learning management system, we could see where you are, where your progress is, and where you might need a little work. And then I could fill in the holes with the bi-weekly Q&A. So check that out. And then my ultimate goal is to create a mastermind group. And I think the Facebook group is sort of morphing into that where, like I said a minute ago, it's very hard to make things work on a pure mechanical basis. And... I think in talking with each other, we're able to, of course, flesh out some ideas. And number two, we're able to figure out ways to beat the market. And then the other thing is like, it's not my way or highway. I'm noticing that some of you guys are doing things slightly differently. And I like to try to keep everybody focused on the trend following and the methodology in general. But it is kind of interesting to see where some of you guys are a little bit of FOMO here and there and doing certain things, but willing to live with those decisions by getting a little getting a little early. So 
anyway, I've been having a lot of fun with it. So that's been really, really cool. All right, let me get my charts up and running here. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. Let's take a look at the micro and then work our way to the macro. So on a micro basis, let's take a look at the P's. The S&P 500. And let's take a look at the spiders to get a true open. So this morning, the spiders, they gapped open, obviously. And so far, they haven't reversed from that gap. Now, if you take a look at a daily chart, when you gap below a major low or even a not so major low like this, it's a little bit more concerning, but it's still concerning nonetheless. Now, when it's down here, gapping low or low, sometimes that could be an opening gap reversal type of play. For instance, SOXL, this thing is severely oversold at this juncture. Now, not that you want to be a trend fighter, but what you're doing is you're looking to catch that intraday reversal, that little bounce from that oversold, and you're getting out by the end of the day. Uh, again, this is something I, dis I discussed in a lot more detail yesterday. But getting back to the P's, as you can see, it's looking fairly ugly in here. In fact, let's clean this chart up. Let's go back to it. Uh... So now with today's slide, the bow tie is now official. We did cross over. And then to complete the pattern, you would need a little bit of a bounce. Let's back the chart way out. And again, potential double tops in the works, double top in the work, and that's kind of ugly. On a weekly basis, doesn't look quite as bad, but that double top is still there, and that V-shaped recovery becomes a little bit more obvious. And again, not to beat the dead horse, but the reason the V-shaped recovery is concerning is by the time market gets all the way back to its, its old highs, in this case, 25% round numbers, it's pretty tired. And go back in time, and I went a few presentations back when it was like a 15% rally, I showed how many years the market doesn't go 15%, doesn't go up 15%, and it's quite a few I bet if you look at 25%, there's not that many years in history where the market went up 20% or more, 25% in this particular case. So, so far, looking a little ugly in here on the S&P 500. As usual, take things one day at a time, honor your stops, and all of those other, what do you call that, disclaimers or warnings apply. NASDAQ 100, as you can see, has bow tied down. Let's just take a look at one more thing in here, and let's see when that crossing actually happened. So the crossing was 20 is less. So hey, a crossing actually happened here. You didn't get the higher high and the higher low though. That's the only problem there. So for all intents and purposes, yes, it's a bow tie, but not officially as far as the pullback after the bow tie. So let's take a look at moving average 96 and then 93. No, so you didn't do the crossing on this day. So any higher high or higher low now in the NASDAQ will cause a bow tie to form. I'm sorry, will cause a bow tie setup. So on this day here, if this would have been a higher high and higher low, that would have been your setup. And then it would have been triggering a short coming into the day. But now it's going to trigger after the first bounce. So again, as I've been saying quite a bit, these bow ties from high levels are worth paying attention to. Russell 2000, looks the ugliest of them all as you can see retrace rally higher let's take a look at the weekly retrace rally higher and then so far selling off out of that retrace now as you go through the sectors you can see that they're all looking pretty ugly in here how's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron <laughs> stop if you heard that before Energy, as you can see, bow tied a while back, triggering not off of all time highs, but still an ugly move nonetheless. Today's, when you add in today's move, especially metals and mining banging out new lows. Conglomerates have been in bad shape for a while. I think 3M or something did that. And let's just find a few more of these sectors in here. Take a look at the banks beginning to break down the new lows. Now, for financials, you want to look at the XLF versus the major mix. Major mix has too many closed in funds in it. But you see the financials were kind of hanging in there. And then with today's action, they're beginning to break down a little bit. Now, there's still a few areas hanging in there, but quite a few look like they could be in trouble. Let's take a look at retail. 
So we back the chart way out. You can see a lot of areas look like the market itself, making these double tops and now beginning to bow tie down. Let's take a look at retail. Let's zoom in on this a little bit. So zooming in on retail, you can see you do have the bow tie officially, and then you have the higher low here. You don't have the higher high, but technically that would be a trigger on that. Let's take a look at the trannies. A lot of people get excited about the trannies. I just kind of scored as just another sector, but yeah, looking at the semiconductor, I'm sorry, the transportation, you can see looking pretty ugly in here, banging out new lows. We did have the bow tie down, and that's already triggered a while ago after banging out brand new highs and then collapsing. So that's not a good thing. Some areas, let's see, uh, like software, still kind of hanging in there in general. But other areas like the semi just looks semi just acts look absolutely abysmal. And you can see the bow tie here after all time highs trigger recently and then what's happened since. So that's pretty ugly. So that's a significant drop from that signal. Nothing magical again about the bow tie or any other this other simplified trend following. But as you can see, sometimes you'll get a signal right before a big drop occurs. And the magnitude of what happens next is going to be vitally important and, and very important for us to keep an eye on this situation. Very oversold marketed here due to have a little bit of a bounce. That in and of itself, other than playing like an opening gap reversal and something like the Soxel, which we have here. Let's take a look at a five-minute chart. So for the aggressive players, if we take out this high in here, this might be worth a shot for a bit of a pop back up towards the towards yesterday's close, okay? Now, you don't want to just rush out and, and buy it just because it's gapping lower. You want to make sure you give it some room like I think it was, uh, was it yesterday, the day before? You had a gap lower, and then it just didn't really materialize higher. So be careful if you're trading these things. kind of dangerous. This is kind of like an S&G type of trade. And then yesterday, of course, was not brand new lows. In general, you want to wait for a gap like today to multi-month lows, especially in an oversold situation like this. And again, we talked a lot about opening gap reversals the past couple of weeks in the Q&A, so check that out. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual questions on individual issues. Now, one thing while we're in an impasse, I talked about this a little bit last week. It is good to take a look at these inverse shares, and if you look at a look at them, you'll see they're bow tying off of these all-time lows or major major lows, and beginning to break out from low levels. It doesn't mean you want to rush out and buy them, because they have bad, really bad tracking errors, and also they'll eventually go to zero, like I talked about last week. So they're not really good for longer-term holding, but shorter term they can be traded, and then also consider. The fact that they help to see, they help you to see both sides of the market. Like I think I said last week, I had a little joke called flip, and it's basically you'd flip somebody's screen when they would go to the bathroom or whatever, and they come back and their screen would be upside down and think that something was really screwed up, and then you just hit a keyboard and comes, you just hit a key and it comes right back. But I used to flip screens as I walk, as I went through them, just to see the how they would look upside down and I, I still occasionally I'll, I'll do that and, and put them in a column and see what people think bullish or bearish but it does help you to gain a little bit of perspective so don't rush out and trade these inverse shares unless you're doing like an opening gap reversal or a possible very short-term swing trade but do use them as another tool to help you see both sides of the market especially if your eye is just trained the long side. Okay, any individual stock picks? Quite a bunch today. I guess everybody fell asleep. <laughs> any stock picks? All right, going once. Well, while we're in impasse, let me just thank you guys real quick for showing up again. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. All right, Don, let's talk about AMD. That's probably going to be a short. No, this is just kind of choppy and all over the place. Let me back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, this is not a – I'm not a big fan of buying stocks mid-range. And let me show you what I mean by that. If we back the chart, chart way out. So you can see we took off it here, and it was kind of all over the place. So we're kind of in the middle of this wide range. I'm not that excited about buying a stock in that range. Also, this is a huge stock as far as 
the amount of shares. I've never seen a number this big. That's what, billions? Millions for sure. Add two zeros to that one, two, one, 606 million. So it looks like it's kind of breaking down in here, like the semis themselves. If you did want to trade a semi, take a look at something like ADI, which was in the Landry list for today. And I could say, I could talk about it. One, because it's thick. And two, because it's not an official setup. I think it's got a lot of support down here. I guess that'd be a good problem to have, but I think if you want to short something, find something coming off of all time highs. Look for that bow tie like we had just right around here. And in this particular case, kind of a first thrust type of setup. So look for that type of setup on the short side. Roku. Well, Roku, you've got one big bar up. So it's just that one big day. And then it's just kind of drifting ever since. So I would leave that alone. I don't see any reason to go after something like that. Just because you have a big bar up and then it just kind of drifted higher in here, that's not a tradable pattern. Yeah, John, I agree. Uh, SWAV, this has been on my Landry list for quite a while, just so I don't forget about it. it th I think it looks absolutely fantastic, but it's going to have to pull back a little bit more. Maybe as far as 50 or more. I'll know it when I see it, like Justice Potter Stewart. M is a short. Well, right now, let's back this chart out a little bit. Right now, okay, this is, so you're all the way down here with this. Right now, let's go back to like ADI, okay? Look where ADI is longer term, and then look where Macy's is longer term. So at this juncture, with the market just coming off of all-time highs, you want to be looking for stocks that are just coming off of all-time highs. Now, if we get into a prolonged bear market, God forbid, then go after those stocks in longer term downturns. But for now, I would focus on stocks at high levels and not so much on stocks that are in extended downtrends and possibly even bottoming out. Okay. Now, this is now, the only thing I'm seeing here is it looks like it trades in chunks. Looks like it has an earnings or something, gaps higher and then has an earnings or something. So. It's very hard for my particular methodology to figure out a place to get on board. And it looks like it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place in between. Now, the other thing that has me a little concerned about this stock is, not to talk out of both sides of my mouth because I like momentum, it's just that this thing looks like it could be priced for perfection way up here. It's had such an incredible run since 2016. Not straight up, but in some cases straight up. So I would find something that hadn't made it this far just yet because once it gets this far this high it begins to become priced for perfection and it could also become a source of funds and the dangerous thing with some of these stocks at very high levels like this at this particular point in time especially if they have ran several hundred percent is that if the market begins to sell off they the bigger they are the harder they fall and then if the market continues to, continues to rally or resumes its rally longer term rally i should say what could happen is they could become the source of funds for uh, profit taking, things like that. So not as excited about something this late of the game, this late in the game. Okay. Is TGT short on this gap up TGT? No, I wouldn't rush out and try. It's just, this kind of, this is all over the place. Okay. Um, if you had a situation where let's say you had a stock that's in a super duper strong uptrend and then a gap lower, Maybe it might be worth playing an opening gap reversal. I played like one in Cree a while back. You can see this particular day here. It's at a solid, solid, solid uptrend. Looks fantastic. Comes in as a big gap lower and then reverses intraday. Let me see if I could put one of those funny charts up so you can see a little bit better. Ah, eh, too much hassle. But something that's strong trend, I wouldn't play something like Target, which is kind of all over the place. I don't think that's what you want to play for an opening gap reversal in an individual stock. As a general statement, you're better off trading these opening gap reversals in something like an index or whatever. But if you are going to play them in individual stocks, make sure you have some tailwind behind you, ideally. You don't want to buy something that's falling out of bed. Now, for instance, like soft sell, that's a sector in and of itself. It's falling out of bed. It might be worth a shot on an opening gap reversal trade because it could have a mother of all bounces higher when it gets severely oversold and the short covering begins to kick in. But on an individual stock that looked like this, I don't think it's worth going after because 
this applies to all markets, but especially individual stock. It's always darkish right before it gets more dark. With an index, same thing applies, but if you're looking for an intraday reversal, a day trade, then I think it's okay to go in, provided, of course, you get some sort of trigger that suggests, the, that suggests it's going to pop higher. At what point does the bow tie in TGT become dead? Well, first of all, the the problem with TGT is, let's get a clean chart, okay? It's kind of an electrocardiogram, all right? It trades in chunks, okay? So it's up, and then it's down, and then it's back up, and then it's down, and now it's back up. So there's no real structure to work with here. So as far as a bow tie, I wouldn't get too excited about a bow tie and something like this, unless again, you're trading a bow tie off of major, major, major highs, okay? So I wouldn't, I just toss the bow tie out completely on something like that. Can you show a stock that shows good structure for a bow tie? Probably like ADI. Um, I'm not excited about going short ADI just because it's got a lot of support below the market. But if you wanted to short things, and, and again, this is this actually would have triggered back here. But if we back the chart out a little bit, let's take a look at a decent looking signal here. Stock makes all time highs. It makes a bow tie down, a little bit of a pop higher. This is also a first thrust too, okay? Meaning that you thrust higher and a little bit of a bounce. So something like that. Something off of all-time highs. Again, I mean, we could just pull up any index you want. But with the overall market looking like this, the Qs in and of themselves, okay, could be a great example of something off of all-time highs. Bow tie here. A little bit of a pullback trigger here, okay. That was a beautiful slide out of that. Hopefully, I shouldn't say hope. I don't want it to go down. But from a pattern standpoint, hopefully it's deja vu all over again and let's see what we got so far so you have the bow tie down now official bow tie so on a bit of a pop so the overall market is making a pretty cool looking bow tie so find individual stocks that look sort of like the overall market brad and i think that's if we continue to slide in here that could be worthwhile we could begin to short some of these stocks okay all right, so this would be, this is just a big gap lower. There's nothing to do with this particular stock. And again, it's kind of just drifting lower. So you certainly don't want to try to pay, play an opening gap reversal when something extreme like this happens. And then now you're just kind of meandering lower. If you wanted to short something, this looks like it's already done. And it's also wide and loose and all over the place. You want to short something that has a little bit of structure, maybe just breaking down from high levels like it was back here but it's still kind of wide and loose stock to begin with, okay? Any more? Well, while we're in impasse, once again, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of a busy schedule. Anything unanswered that requires thought, shoot me an email, or better yet, uh, submit it through the contact form, davelander.com slash contact, and if it requires a lot of thought, I'll cover it in a Q&A. If it's something that's fairly quickly, we'll cover it in the next week. Oh, you too, Jay. appreciate it. All right, everybody, enjoy your holiday weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Oh, by the way, I think I'm going to take off next week just because it's a shortened week, not as much to talk about. So I'll return uh, early June on that. So now I'll, I'll have to put a post up somewhere on that. All right, thanks again, and we'll talk again in a couple of weeks.